Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us on another episode of Dermatology X, the channel that brings to you dermatology education, whether you're a dermatology resident, whether you're studying for the USMLE exams, or whether you've stumbled across this channel by chance, having an interest in skin, hair, and nail disease, I'm sure we have something here for you. Today's presentation is part three on our series looking at cutaneous T cell lymphoma disorders. And we are specifically discussing the staging of mycosis fungoides, which if you haven't heard of this condition before, go back to our part one and part two videos in this series where we touch upon this subtype of cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Disclaimers, as per usual, these videos are for entertainment purposes only and do not constitute medical advice. There may be errors on these slide contents. If you require medical help, please seek professional medical assistance and advice. And please have fun with these videos and good luck with your studies. So just to recap, Mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome represent approximately 65% of all cases of cutaneous T cell lymphoma, and therefore make up the largest pr proportion of this group. And they are characterized by monoclonal proliferation, but predominantly CD4 as well as CD45 R0 T helper cells, and are associated with the loss of mature T cell antigens in the skin as well as other involved organs. When do you suspect uh, mycosis fungoides? Well, the diagnosis is generally made on multiple criteria across these domains. So clinical criteria, histopathological criteria, as well as immunopathological criteria. In terms of clinical, these cases often present with persistent or progressive Patches and plaques, which can be erythematous and scaly as a classic form. But in the previous video, we've touched upon multiple variants of mycosis fungoides, which can be very tricky to identify. So it's important to keep a wide differential. The skin findings are often in non-sun exposed locations, otherwise described as sun bathing suit distribution. They have variation in size and shape, and they can have poikiloderma which comprises of atrophy, variation in pigmentation, as well as telangiectasias. In terms of histological criteria, they're characterized by superficial lymphoid infiltrate, as well as epidermotropism and lymphoid atypia. Lymphoid atypia refers to cells with enlarged hyperchromatic nuclei and irregular or cerebriform contours. T cell receptor gene rearrangement studies for mycosis fungoides can also show clonality, but this is only a minor criteria. This clonality can be seen in a number of other benign skin conditions and dermatoses as well. And then there's immunopathological criteria, where there's a loss of mature T cell markers, such as CD2, 3, and 5, which is less than the 50% threshold, as well as loss of CD7, less than 10% or less than 10% of T cells. Another criteria is epidermal discordance from expression of CD2, 3, 5, or 7 on dermal T cells. So back onto the main topic of this video, why is staging important for mycosis fungoides? There's multiple reasons why you would like to stage a case of MF. It's for prognostication, so to know what to expect, um, to guide management as depending on whether it's an early stage or late stage case, the management options differ. To assess treatment response, as well as standardization across research and clinical trials. It's important to remember that in terms of staging for MF, not all cases have to progress through all the stages in sequential order. 
And cases within the same stage group can still have different causes of disease and respond differently to treatments. What do we do to assess a case for staging? So we need to look at firstly the skin and assess the extent of skin involved, whether it's patches, plaques, or larger such as tumors and the body surface area involved. In terms of lymph nodes, it's important to assess the size, the number, the location, and depending on the size and, and how palpable they are, they, this may require further investigation with a node biopsy. It's important to investigate <clears throat> findings from the blood, including a full blood count with differential, as well as various other blood tests, including liver function testing and prognostication with markers such as LDH and beta-2 microglobulin. It's important to assess the blood and tissue with flow cytometry, as well as assessment of clonality with T-cell gene rearrangement PCR testing. And in terms of looking at other organs to assess the extent of spread of disease, so looking for any evidence in liver, spleen, lung by imaging is also very important. And there's various imaging modalities present, including CT scanning, PET scan, as well as MRI imaging. So this is one of the key consensus papers produced by the International Society for Cutaneous Lymphomas, as well as the European Organization of Research and Treatment of Cancer, which have come up with the guidelines and recommendations for an assessment of cases of mycosis of fungoides. And there are several different di dif definitions to keep in mind when looking at these guidelines. If you haven't read this paper, I do highly recommend everyone to read it. It is very useful, particularly if um, you want to have a heightened understanding of the recommendations with regards to workup and treatment of patients with mycosis fungoides. So in this paper, <clears throat> they have defined patch as any size skin lesion without significant elevation or induration, whereas a plaque indicates any skin lesion that has elevation or is indurated. It's important to note whether these lesions have any secondary changes, including scale, crusting, or poikiloderma. And it's also important to note any histological features, including folliculotropism or large cell transformation, greater than 25%, whether these are CD30 plus or CD30 negative, and any other clinical features, such as ulceration. Tumor is defined as lesions with at least one centimeter diameter solid or nodular lesions with evidence of depth as well as vertical growth. For nodes, abnormal peripheral lymph nodes indicate any palpable peripheral node on physical examination, which is firm, irregular, clustered, fixed, or 1.5 centimeters or large in diameter. And involvement of viscera, including the spleen and liver, can be diagnosed using imaging. In terms of blood, cesare cells are defined as lymphocytes with hyperconvoluted cerebriform nuclei. Alternatively, if cesare cell count is not possible, then using flow cytometry criteria, including the following so, an expanded CD4 positive or CD3 positive cells with a greater CD4 to CD8 ratio of greater than 10 or more. Or the other criteria is expanded CD4 plus cells with abnormal immunophenotype, including loss of CD7 or CD26. <clears throat> a T cell clone is defined by PCR or Southern blot analysis of the T cell receptor gene. This is just a pictorial representation of a cesare cell which is the abnormal um, lymphocyte with the cerebriform nucleus. You can see here that it has scant light blue cytoplasm. Nucleoli is usually absent, and it's got an irregularly shaped nuclear membrane, which has been likened to 
the cerebriform nature of a brain, hence cerebriform nucleus. In terms of the staging system that has been recommended in the 2007 consensus paper, <clears throat> it's been separated into two stages overall, broad categories, so early stage and late stage. So in terms of early stage, this comprises of 1A, 1B, and 2A. In stage 1A, this is patches and plaques which cover less than 10% or less than one-tenth of the body surface area, whereas in stage 1B, these are patches and plaques which cover greater than 10% of the body surface area. Stage 2A is defined as any patches and plaques with a clinically evident node. In advanced stage disease, this comprises of stages from 2B to 4B. In 2B, these are tumors, um, These can be one or more raised lumps or tumors in the skin. The lymph nodes may or may not be enlarged necessarily. Um, and they may not have lymphoma cells on histological examination. In stage three, stage three can be separated into 3A or 3B. 3A is erythroderma alone. So that's involvement of greater than 80% of the body surface area with generalized redness, swelling, itching, and sometimes pain. The lymph nodes may be enlarged, but do not contain abnormal lymphoma cells typically. Um, and in 3A, there's few or no lymphoma cells in the bloodstream. Whereas in 3B, this is erythroderma as well as blood involvement. So there's moderate levels of lymphoma cells or scissory cells in the bloodstream. So defined here is greater than 5%, but no clone on T-cell rearrangement studies or less than 1,000 sensory cells per millimeter cubed. Stage four involves the skin as well as has spread to lymph nodes, bloodstream, or other organs. So in stage 4A1, this is a high tumor burden of leukemic disease. And this is defined as greater than 1,000 sensory cells per millimeter cubed or a positive clone on T-cell rearrangement studies or a CD4 to CD8 ratio of greater than or equal to 10 or CD4 and CD7 greater than or equal to 40% or CD4 and CD26 greater than or equal to 30%. In stage four, in stage four, A2, there is numerous abnormal lymphoma cells in the lymph nodes. And this is defined as clinically abnormal lymph node with a histology Dutch grade of three to four. And in stage 4B, this is defined as metastatic disease involving in other organs, including liver, spleen, and lung. So it's all very, um, Quite, quite full on in terms of the different stages. So why is it important to, to stage? Um, as alluded to earlier, staging provides information on prognostication. So from one of the prior publications, these are the approximate five-year overall survival rates of MF according to different stages. As you can see, stage 1A essentially has a prognosis which is similar to the normal population survival rates of 90 to 100%, whereas in the most severe stage, stage 4B, which has metastatic disease, the survival rate at five years is zero to 15%. Now there's also an equivalent form of staging which uses the TNM system, which has traditionally been used in other forms of cancer. Um, so defining in terms of the tumor node status and metastatic status within the tumor or T stage, there's four levels. So ranging from T1 to T4. So T1 is limited patches or plaques covering less than 10%, whereas T2 is patches, plaques, and papules greater than 
or equal to 10%. T3 is one or more tumors, and T4 is erythroderma, which is greater than or equal to 80% of the surface area. In terms of node involvement, you can have N0, which is no node involvement, N1, which is clinical involvement, so you can feel these nodes, but um, minimal evidence histologically. You, and this varies all the way up to N2 and N3, which is where you have both significant clinical palpable nodes as well as histological involvement of the lymph nodes. M or the metastatic stage. So M1 is visceral involvement, whereas M0 is no other organ involvement. And then as an extra on top of the standard TNM system, there's a T and there's the B stage, which refers to blood involvement. So this includes B0, which is minimal blood involvement, B1, which is a low tumor burden. So greater than 5% containing a typical Cesare cells, but not meeting the criteria of B2. And B2 is the high tumor burden load, which is greater than or equal to 1,000 uh, per microliter Cesare cells with positive clone. So the TNMB staging system is just another way to define the stage. And the next table is a way of equating the one staging system with the TNMB staging system. So this is just a bonus slide. Um, speaking about two other histological findings, which is not part of the current form of the staging system, but has important prognostication information because it is associated with poor prognosis. So it's important to take into account these factors when working out or thinking of the prog prog prognosis for these cases. So the first one is the folliculotropic form of mycosis fungoides. So as alluded to in the previous video, these involve atypical CD4 plus T lymphocytes which surround and infiltrate the hair follicles, hence the name folliculotropism. Um, it has a similar five-year survival, but a significantly worse 10-year survival rate compared to patients with tumor stage mycosis fungoides. And that's very significant. And the other histological finding to take into account is large cell transformation. So large cell transformation, that's defined as a biopsy specimen, which has large cells. These are greater than four times the size of a, a typical small lymphocyte. And transformation, large cell transformation refers to having 25% level or more of these atypical large cells in the dermal infiltrate. And this is also more common in tumor stage mycosis fungoides and indicates a poorer, a poorer prognosis. Thank you for joining us on this video presentation. I hope you've learned something interesting and useful from this video. And I look forward to joining you in the next video in this series on cutaneous T-cell lymphoma.